My name is Tina Ruggieri, and I am the assistant curator at the Abrams Engel Institute for the Visual Arts. And we are located at the University of Alabama at Birmingham's campus in Birmingham, Alabama. Today, I am joined with artist Shona McAndrew. Uh, Shona received her BA in psychology and painting with honors in, the 2000, in 2012 from Brandeis University. In 2014, a post baccalaureate in fine arts from Brandeis University and also received her MFA in painting from the Rhode Island of School of Design. Shona lives and works in Philadelphia. She is a multidisciplined artist who work, whose work ranges from sculpture, painting, installation, and digital collage. Um, she depicts women in intimate private and mundane moments. These moments are not intended to be viewed by strangers, yet she challenges the viewer to recognize the beauty in every woman's body. Many of Shona's figures are of plus-size women modeled after herself and friends. They are often presented partially or fully nude. Shona's work draws on her personal experiences as a plus-size woman, often using her own struggles with society's expectations of womanhood. She identifies with her works, the women that she creates as her friends, allies, and her self-portraits and moments that reveal some of, the, some of a woman's most personal yet banal moments in life. These moments showcase women who are unembarrassed of their exposed bodies and carefree from the viewer's gaze. Shona, I want to thank you so much for taking the time and joining me today. First, can you give us a little bit more insight into your background, where you grew up, and how you became interested in art? Thank you for having me. Um, I was born and raised in Paris, in France, not by French parents. Uh, so our culture was very different from the one around me and something that my family liked to do as a whole, even though our own family was a bunch of different cultures, was go to museums mm -hmm. every week and take art classes every week. So growing up in Paris is an incredible privilege and an easy place to fall in love with art. And it was the one tradition that my family had that we upheld, that and dinners all together every night. Those are the two, cons no, yeah, so that was, and, um, my mother loves art. My grandmother loves art. I think a lot of women in my family, that's part of our lineage as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, it led me to taking art classes at university. That led me to going to grad school for painting. I never thought I would be a painter one day. It was just what my family did. Yeah. So how were the influences of you know, going to these museums. I mean, Paris has historically been a major art um, world city. And so just the, the different types of styles and movements that have happened in Paris alone, how has that influenced you? Well, I grew up looking at a lot of, two different kind of things really resonated with me when I was younger. It was a lot of nude women, a lot of paintings, portraits of women, a lot of women that, didn't look like what I thought it would look like. I My father's favorite story is knowing I was his baby because I was twice as big as all the other babies in the hospital the day I was born. So kind of lost the who's the thinnest person in the room day one um, game. Uh, so they, it, um, seeing all of these women, I don't know, it was very defining and it was what I thought art was about. And at the same time, I was also seeing epic art. So masterpieces and grandiose pieces and grandiose art and just things that were so much bigger than me or anything I thought a human could do. And so I think I, I had those two influences and forces in my life, wanting to make work that was overwhelming and, and grand mm -hmm. and also making work considering that history that I had lived with, which was nude women and women as muse and women as objects to be desired by men and I my favorite little thing to say is you know for a lot of art history it was really the porn of history you know men wanted yeah. to see nude women they wanted to own an image of a nude woman so they'd get a painting made or they'd buy 
a painting. So history really does trace back men's desire. Yeah. So those, yeah. So those two things I think kind of mesh together and made, for example, that piece on the screen right now, which yeah. is, you know, both grand and discussing the nude. Yes. And so this piece, um, it's an installation from the 2019 Spring Break Art Show, which this was my first introduction to your work. And um, so it's titled Sometime Last Night. And I just kind of wanted to hear from you about what you were, what was going through your mind when you created these sculptures and this full immersive installation. So that's a actual portrait of me and my boyfriend in bed. And that is a fantastical interpretation of my bedroom. My bedroom was set up that way, except I didn't have a blue dresser. I had a black one. Yeah. My walls aren't as pretty, but that's pretty much what it looks like, and especially the mess. Um, and I remember when I wrote the proposal for this before I had really started it, uh, I wanted to make something that allowed people into the world and discovered on their own and find moments that were important to them. I think that's a lot of what interested me in sculpture was allowing people to move around and find little things mm -hmm. that seem like no one had seen it before and you're just the first one to have found it. Yeah. That's, paintings can absolutely do that, but my paintings were not yet. And that's why I turned to sculpture because it allowed me to create these layers and actual hidden spots. And this piece has, a, I think, 58 sculpted objects, mm -hmm. and that allowed for a lot of connections to be made and little moments to discover. I think that's really what appealed to me in making this. And then also just having, you know, a body, a plus-size body next to a fit, young, blonde man's body, which is what my boyfriend looks like. And, uh, oh. I'm going to show the other view just so that they can see. Absolutely. Um, and so, like you said, I mean, each one of these little objects from the Coke cans on the nightstand to the tampon, the books, the magazines, the plants, all of that has been sculpted, um, for this installation. Yes. The shoes down on the floor, that bra, and, uh, and then like the mattress was not paper mache. I, the, the pillows are real pillows. I did make the pattern mm -hmm. and I I, those glitter pillows I, I made myself. Um, but I do like ones, I like textures interacting with textures. I think it would be quite rigid if the whole thing was paper mache. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a play it's, of material. So. It's definitely an explosive, uh, you know, it, of color. There's just so much color happening. So it definitely draws you in. It's almost like the figures are the, like, they are the main subject, but you get engrossed with all these colors and in this environment and then you realize there are these two figures in the bed which is um, also what I wanted I want you to like kind of walk by it and, and not not notice but yeah forget to uh be weirded out by it or be you know uncomfortable by it I want you just yeah. to feel natural around them and I I definitely can feel that um and I definitely sense that when I'm around it and so um, you know, I mean, sexuality is always kind of a taboo subject matter, but you're confronting it very much head on, but in a very graceful and natural way, I believe, um, that makes people think kind of the, ap the, the sexualness of it is the aftermath of your thought process. Um, and so I want to move on to um, Wednesday night, which is um, currently an installation at Moore College. But um, it's going to travel to Ava in the spring of 2021. And so we're super excited to have it here. Um, and so I want to just say that there are many reasons that I was personally drawn to your work. I see many references to contemporary art history, but also the long lineage of the female nude that we've already kind of touched on a little bit. I think a little bit about Jenny Seville. She's known for depicting women who are also considered plus size. But in her earlier work, she's interested in um, the imperfections of flesh, and she pushed those limits of figure painting. Um, I also think a little bit about Dwayne Hansen. He does these hyper-realistic sculptures of the working class and often using people from real life and also showing them in just these mundane moments. I can make tons of connections um, to all different types of artists, but my point is that I do see many connections in your art to other artists working with the human figure. 
But what I find the most intriguing about your work is that you, these simplistic moments that all women can connect with, these moments um, that are not documented or even seen beyond self-reflection. And so with these statements, I have two questions. Um, first, what artists um, have you been inspired by or take inspiration from? And the second part is, why do you specifically choose to highlight these personal, banal moments in a woman's life? Well, there's there's the art historical part. So yeah. I think a lot about Matisse. Mm -hmm. He was one of my first loves in art history. And one of the men who painted the Udadisks, which I grew up looking at. Uh -huh. And sculpture, which I hope I'm, maybe there'll be a bigger slide of it, all the way at the back, who is sitting in the armchair. She's very much taken one-to-one -one from a Matisse Udadisk painting. Um, so that, so I look at a lot of art history. I look at a lot of men who painted women, but Matisse always had such a, a sensitive touch but was still a man painting a woman who was there to be looked at. So he was an interesting person to work with. Uh -huh. And that arm in the air pose is um, one of my favorites. I do it, I sleep like that, I sit like that. So it's a, it's a, it's a body pose that comes up a lot in paintings uh -huh. and in sculptures because it's something I do so naturally, but it's also yeah. referring to that. And then more currently, I mean, there's so many, I mean, it's a lot of, not peers, but women who are alive today and who are some so young, someone like Jordan Castile, mm -hmm. is, I think about enormously. I, I think she's a very generous creator and maker, both as an object that she makes, it's so generous to look at, and there's so much to discover and it's so luscious, but it's also, she's also a generous um, thinker, you know, what what she does with these people she works with, the connection she has. Uh, I always think about how incredible I, the pictures of her openings where these people see these paintings of her up on the wall, of themselves up on the wall, mm -hmm. and how incredible that is to do what she's doing. Yeah. Um, and so she's a peer only in the sense that she's alive now and we're about, we're around the same age. Yeah. She's I, I think an enormous amount. And I think she, we do similar, we have similar thoughts. Not, we're not doing the same thing, but we, we're, our hearts in the same place. Yeah. And I'm very, I don't know, I, I think about her and everything that I do. She is a wonderful artist. And um, sat, uh, I, I recently discovered her work within like maybe the last year. I know she's been working a lot longer than that. And um, I would echo that y'all's heart is coming from the same place while the work is different. Um, it's very interesting connection there. Um, so why do you specifically choose to highlight uh, just these mundane moments in these women's lives? I think, you know, growing up in Paris, I grew up with a lot of beautiful women and a lot of images of beauty mm -hmm. and a lot of, description of women and what it meant to be a woman that didn't in any way match up with who I was. Mm -hmm. I was never thin. I was never the prettiest girl. I was never all these things that I grew up wrong, wrongly believing were defining features of women. Mm -hmm. I became an observer at quite a young age, just looking at women. And I remember thinking all the time, I can't believe she and I are both women. And, it's, and I would really say that all the time because I really didn't, because I didn't understand that there was just so many ways of being a woman. And yeah. So I, when I think about these things, that, like I really thought I was the only one who had hair in the worst places or would have, you know, all these little things that every woman goes through. Mm -hmm. I thought I was the only one because I just didn't hear anyone talk about it and I didn't see it anywhere. And I just didn't know. You don't know what you don't see or take in. And I enjoy capturing these moments that are mundane, but also very important to what it means to be a person every day, you know, yeah. and they're, they're important because of that. Yeah. And, um, and I wish when I were, was a young lady, I knew that other people existed in a body the same way that I do. And so yeah, and and all of these sculptures in front of you—they're all from my imagination. 
and they're all variations of me, Leanne. That's a variation of my body three times or four times over there. Yeah. And even one of them is a self-portrait, the one of me standing with my boyfriend. And uh, I, that's why now I work based on actual women and not my imagination because it's allowed me to sculpt different kinds of bodies and sculpt different kinds of moments that are not limited only to my own experience of a woman, which was something I was working through for so long. Yeah. And that makes sense. And that is something that um, is another reason why I'm drawn to your work is because that you are showing women in a way that really hasn't been done. We're not being sexualized where your works aren't there for the male gaze. They're, they're almost really there for the female gaze. For, for women to identify with and go, oh, well, I've done that before, or that's me. And just like what you're saying, connecting with um, art in a way that happens in our everyday lives. Um, and then that's something very special for a lot of women, like especially when you're young. And like you said, you don't know that other women are going through this because you're kind of shy to talk about it. Or, you, you know, especially in American culture, we don't really talk about you know, puberty or, you know, anything that has to do with the body or sex. And so it's a very taboo. Um, bodies in general. My mother, my grandmother recently passed away and she was, grew up in Scotland mm -hmm. and was very poor and not very educated at all. And when she died, still didn't have a true understanding of her body or other women or, you know, and my mother's the same. I feel like my mother took a very long time to come to terms with being a person in a body and what it meant to care for yourself and to appreciate yourself. But I think you can catch it young, but it is yeah. this is a trick for all women. I, when I first showed these sculptures, interestingly enough, most of the people who were coming to me were mothers of my friends or people who were at the event. And they didn't stop thinking, oh my God, that's me last night. That was like, I... <laughs> Like I had tapped into this connection I had with women in their mid sixties. Yeah. <laughs> no, I had, and it's because we're all still going through the same thing. You know, there's no answers out there for women from a different generation. We're all just as curious and misinformed. Yeah, um, I agree. Um, so one thing I want to talk about, I'm going to move to Louise here with you standing next to her. Um, I want to talk about your choice of material. A lot of these are made out of paper mache, and I I don't know the answer to this, but I'm very interested in how you came about using paper mache and why you like to use it to sculpt. I mean, the silly true story was the summer before graduate school, I went home to Paris, and I was really nervous for graduate school. I did not feel like I was at the didn't feel ready and I thought everyone would be better than me and I was just very nervous, just a student who was nervous what she was doing. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to try something new and something I could transport back with me to Paris just to refresh my mind and not think about what was coming up ahead. So I found this video on YouTube of this woman who made a paper mache version of her French bulldog and it was very simple and very sweet and it was just like a woman in her 60s and she just loved her dog and it was such a cute video and I was like that's within my means. So I made my first little sculpture, who's this little lady who's sitting upstairs. And it was not very well done. I used paint to sculpt. I layered on layers to make the nose. Now I actually sculpt it. I didn't really know what I was doing. Yeah. And she yeah. was adorable. And I brought her to graduate school with me just to sit on my desk as something cute I had made, not thinking anything of it. And people would walk by my paintings and go straight to it. And when they came into my studio and one summer, the, it was my first show in New York. I had six weeks before when I got the news that was happening, and I decided to go crazy and make my first life-size sculpture. So I went from that first little sculpture in Paris to a year later, just jumping in. And I very much feel like most of my best ideas and best moments come when I trust my gut and go for something much bigger and scarier than I ever thought. So that's why life-size sculptures was my immediate decision. And paper mache is just a very forgiving material. It's very, I like it because it's just, an, it, it appears easy, but it is not an easy medium. It takes a lot of time, a lot of layers, a lot of care for each moment. Yeah. No, and then you get to paint. And sometimes I just see it as I'm building 
a I'm building a canvas a dimensional canvas for uh, yeah. Yeah. two months and then I get to paint skin after so it has a feel that I'm creating a surface to, that wants to be painted on and then that uh, they you there that I don't know if you can see in the belly of my sculpture there's the ripples and there's a, a real feeling of tension paper because I need to spend so much time sculpting it and layering it and sanding it down you get these nice moments that feel like finger marks or actual body and I don't know, there's, I really love paper mache. It's a, I'm about to start a massive, and in, in my second installation. That's gonna be the first time I paper mache in just a couple months. I've been painting a, a more recently. And I am so excited. I'm gonna make <laughs> like three new women and I am over the moon. I can't wait to see them. <laughs> um, so let's, you did, a, you had a show last year. Oh, oh, I forgot about this one. I'm sorry. Um, so this no. is a morning sun. So this is one of the paintings that we're going to have in addition to Wednesday night. I know there's already a painting in that installation. Um, and we're going to get a couple of extras for this, the show that's going to come to Ava. And um, I kind of wanted to show this because the paintings we're about to go to, your style has changed a little bit. And we'll, I'll get you to touch on that, but um, this is a painting of you, correct? Yes, I very much like this painting. It was the first full big painting I made and was completed. And yeah, it is right before my style. My, I'm not gonna say my style changed. It's just my knowledge of my own skills changed. Mm -hmm. um, but I, yeah, I like this painting. It's a I love this painting, um, and it's called Morning Sun, and so it does make me think about kind of getting up in the morning and taking that morning stretch and the, this just glow of sun coming through a window. Um, it makes me think of that and I love that. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is one of your digital collages, which we're gonna get into um, for your show that was at Chart Gallery called Muse. Um, and so I have this here because I, I know that this is, the digital collages is, is part of your process. And I wanted you to discuss that process and how it related to your show muse at chart so this is a digital collage is a picture of myself that's always how my digital collages start mm -hmm. it starts with as you can see the top uh, left side of the painting there's of the digital collage there's a painting of a woman mm -hmm. and that is i don't know the exact title of it i mean it's somewhere in my files yeah but it is a 19th century painting of a woman in a harem waiting, and as I like to say in my, how I see it, waiting to be activated and by mm -hmm. a man and to give her purpose and meaning. And I reenact these poses in my home in my own way mm -hmm. and turn them into digital collage and then send this digital collage to my model and explain where the painting is coming from mm -hmm. and how I want her to re, uh, to recreate my own pose in her own way. So I like to, it's like kind of like an art historical game of telephone. <laughs> I love it. With um, a feminist twist. And it ends up with a final painting. And they don't, you know, a lot of things vary. I, I think a lot about the women and they send me back their own bathrooms and I'll, you know, I'll react to their own images. Same thing here. Yeah. This one got to be one of my favorite paintings just because I love the, minimal color palette that was a lot of fun i mixed one massive amount of one color oof and then that one my big foot there i like this one too i do like this one and i like the painting that it was created from but and i think i have a i have installation shots from your show at muse um so we we see instead of the life size sculptures um you have these smaller scale sculptures but then you have these large paintings and um um so I see like this one it, with on the right hand, I guess on my right hand side, kind of is reminiscent of one of those digital collages. That's the, that's what the first one we discussed. That's yeah. what it turned into. Very different color palette. Yeah. And I just responded to her own bathroom. Yeah. And her space. And so mm -hmm. this, you know, this one here on the left is the one that was for that last digital collage is what came out of it. Is that correct? Yeah, yes, that's my beautiful model. Her name is Daniela. She's wonderful. <laughs> and um, 
And so I guess something I hadn't realized until our conversation just now is that you actually started with these smaller scaled uh, paper mache sculptures and then move to the larger scale works? Though my, that first one was really not finished and it was very much a more craft. It was very crafty and I had no, I didn't know it was even art. So I didn't, I didn't make it with any, I mean, which is sometimes a great thing. That's not a bad thing not to know you're, you're making, you know, there's something freeing there. These, Though it was my first, inst these new ones are more like my life-size sculptures than that first little sculpture I made. But yeah, it's true. I, I always forget that I made that first little lady upstairs. And it's um and this one here in the foreground of the small sculpt is one of my personal favorites. I absolutely adore that one. Um, <laughs> um, and so this was. Uh, this show was extremely incredible. And, um, and so I just think that your process in making these is something that needs to be touched on because you do start with yourself. You start with a painting that you're interested in from art history, you reenact it, and then you send it to your model and your model reenacts it in their own way and then becomes the painting. Um, and, and then it's like three sources to work from the painting, yeah. the digital collage and the image of the model. So, yeah. I love it. Um, and so let me see if I. Okay, so now we're into some newer work. So this one is actually from this year. Um, and I have, I think, three of your new pa newer paintings um, coming up. And so one of my questions is, you know, I had mentioned uh, that you got a BA in psychology. Um, can you talk about a little bit about an underlying psychological aspect to your work? Definitely. I mean, I really thought I was going to be a psychologist up until the year I was applying to graduate school for psychology. My professor said, have you considered art? And then I know I took an immediate <laughs> right turn. <laughs> but I, I think that's why I've loved painting one woman mm -hmm. and think about one person. I, I really like, I, know, I I think I care a lot about what it means to be vulnerable. I think a lot about that and what it means for her to share an image like that with me of herself. Mm -hmm. Someone who we only have a relationship over social media. Mm -hmm. And and so I, I think I spend a lot of time thinking about what this would mean for someone to be painted and how much I want to respect her and make the painting something that reflects who I who I see in her and who I see in women. Mm -hmm. So that a lot of, I just have a, such a love affair with women. I just think we're incredible. And I, I wish more, I mean, I, it's said so much now. I just, I love how much that's focus is. Yeah. You know, and so I just want to be one other person who is doing her best to make these women feel and understand that they're important. Yeah. That's you know, because there's something about portraiture, obviously, the people who got portraits of themselves were either friends of artists, but typically were people who had wealth and wanted to be remembered. And there's something true about that, like being captured that way and being looked at so closely by someone, which is what being painted is. You know, I, I look at, that's a, but painting is larger than life. So I had a lot, I had to really look really close to the images she sent me. Yeah. And that's quite vulnerable to send images to someone when you know they're going to zoom in to look at like you know literally where each mole is. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So the, I feel I feel like I owe these women a lot when they give me the, when they share themselves like this for yeah. my work. So, but I like that. It's pressure. It's pressure for me to step up my game and never ever let down the opportunity and never let down what think, they've done. I think also I think I we had kind of touched on it a little bit is that. So there's also that psychological aspect of these are really made for the female gaze, not the male gaze. And so, but as a female coming to them, there is just like this level of like understanding and respect and connection that you can get not only with your models, but also with your viewer in that way, um, which is a nice added. Here is another newer one um, as well. Um, she's my all-time favorite plus-size model. 
Her name is Tess Holliday, and she is the first plus size woman in the public eye that I had ever experienced. And she's amazing and badass and so open about who she is. And it was just a very ex exciting to paint her, a real thrill. <laughs> I think I remember you talking about that a little bit on your social media. Yeah. Um, and so I just have one more question. And um, I know you said that like stylistically, you don't feel that your work has changed a little bit, but it seems like they have when you go back to some of the, the earlier works and even the work just from last year at Muse, um, there's already a development that's happening. Is, is this um, something that is consciously happening or unconsciously happening or? That's why I, I agree it's style, but it's also, to be honest, just skill. I, yeah. I've, I, when I made that first painting we looked at where that skin was so orange and oh. I had just started painting again after years of not sculpting. So I was oh. just beginning to paint again and not very confident yet. And, you know, painting, painting is just a, a game of illusion and it yeah. works well when you're very confident and you, you, keep the illusion up the whole way. You never let a single moment down. And that's something you learn. You learn to do for yourself. And then, so this piece, which is sitting right next to me right here, <laughs> it definitely is, you know, I'm thinking, obviously the lighting is very different. I, I, the skin colors are much truer to real life and the palettes are much more limited. And I am painting, I think I paint better now than I did a year or two ago. And yeah. that's just because I've been painting so much. You know, yeah. paint, the more you paint the better. You you know what you know. You know what you can do. And you know what to focus on. Yeah, that just like, happens with time and development and definitely. Um, but there is a, obviously style. I, yeah. I want. I would. Per, I prefer this to that. I prefer this style to the first image we looked at with my arms in the air. This is just more appealing. I think I've been realizing that I like to live with very calm palettes. Yeah. And lived with a lot of those pieces with like the arm in the air in my home for quite some time before they were in shows and uh, sometimes bright colors are a bit triggering for me so i think i'm also indulging into my own taste and like accepting that i have my own tastes my own taste is calmer softer palettes that are soothing i like to be soothed <laughs> <laughs> i understand completely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Shona, um, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you, and, and I appreciate you giving us a little bit more insight into your work and your practice. Um, I am super excited to have Wednesday night come to Ava. We all are um, in the spring of 2021, and um, I just can't wait until you and your women are all here in Birmingham, and I just want to thank you again. Mm -hmm. Me too. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.